So let's talk about the Unit 2 essay. Uh, I've given the dog a bone, so he should be distracted, give us a bit of time. And uh, so the first thing we want to do is to separate out uh, the various tasks that are before us when we do this essay. So let's talk about just what you need to do for uh, this essay prompt. This is the thing you want to do anytime somebody assigns you to do something, whether that's in class, whether that's at your job, whether that's on some government form or something, you always want to make sure you do everything you're being asked to do. And to do is to just break this up. So Indigo is normally an autonomous person. Okay, that's just set up. Uh, discuss how she would go about making an important decision. Okay, so that's one thing you need to do. Um, next thing, you need to go into depth about the concept of autonomy and what is what has to be going on for someone for them to be autonomous. It's not a very good sentence, but hopefully that makes sense. So this word require you to do something, uh, that's telling you there's a task here. Uh, a slogan will not be enough, so it's not going to be enough to just say autonomy means being the boss of you and then running with that. We're going to need more detail, but we'll get to that in a bit. And... Uh, Let's see, the next thing we need to do, then discuss in detail. So discuss, again, I'm giving you a imperative. Uh, discuss in detail one way someone's act someone else's actions could undermine the autonomy of her choice. Okay, and finally, discuss in detail uh, some how some social forces could also be impairing the autonomy. And that tells you that I won't, where I haven't said yet what order to take them in, um, there's different ways to do it, but those are the tasks. There's one more task to to point out, which is you're gonna need to um, here. Um, uh, so let's just say the example. How about that? Okay. So you want to make sure that your the example you're gonna give is gonna help you do everything else in the in the prompt. But I'll talk about that uh, separately in a minute. Okay. So. What's the sort of logical way to go about doing this? Um, probably either the setup or the discussion of autonomy is going to need to come first. So this could be w number one or number two, right? Um, this is also number one or number two. So the, you're either going to start with the setup of the example or you're going to talk about start off by talking about autonomy and then get into the particular example. Okay, but... Those are the things you're going to have to do up front. And you can do the sort of problem cases. So as you can see, the way I like to assign these essay topics is usually um, you do a bunch of explanation, and then I ask, you know, I, then I sort of raise some problems or raise some challenging tasks for you to do, okay? So there's basically, as you can see, four main tasks that comprise this essay. You're either going to do the example and the setup, I'm just going to write it this way. Autonomy generally, any specific things that you'll need. And again, these two can be done in either order, depends on how you want to approach it. Uh, then you've got somebody, you know, um, other people uh, preventing autonomy. Oops, uh, I'll just write autonomy, sorry. In my notes I always write, uh, my, my handwritten notes are always a mix of different languages, so sorry about that. Um, I guess I could edit that out, but whatevs. All right, and then, uh, you know, sort of social cultural uh, forces on autonomy, okay? You want to make sure that you pick an example that's going to help you throughout the rest of the, the paper that you write. Um, so you want to make sure that you have something that's relatively high stakes, relatively important, because <clears throat> autonomy is, you know, all about doing uh, the things that seem important to us, things that are in accordance with what we actually really, what we really want. 
So that's not going to be as easy to see when you're talking about small choices, like um, what to have for lunch in most cases. Um, you want a bigger choice, right? So you want to talk about um, choosing a major, choosing a career, uh, choosing whether to settle down with a particular person, big purchases, stuff like that. Those kind of things are um, make it easier to see whether or not a person is actually living in a way that expresses what she really wants, what she really cares about. The other thing to say here is that you'll probably not be able to resist picking an example at the very beginning when you start working on this, but you don't want to be too um, super committed to it or super tied to it uh, because what you want is an example that's going to allow you to uh, explain, you know, it's going to help you explain what autonomy is and it's gonna help you illustrate some of the problems that can arise when a person is trying to be autonomous. So you want an example that's gonna work for all of that. And it might be a little hard to see how an example is gonna work until you've actually tried to do it, okay? If you need to pick an example off the bat at the, at the beginning, that's fine. Um, just don't get too tightly tied to it. It's very easy to change the example um, once you've kind of gone all the way through the paper if you've realized it doesn't do what you want it to do. The main thing that's going to occupy most of your, your paper is this, the talking about what autonomy is, what a person needs to um, have going on for them in order to be autonomous. There's a bunch of different things you can talk about, and I don't want you to go into a ton of different versions of these things. It's better to just pick a couple and be precise and say, you know, go into a bit of depth about them, because uh, that will make it easier for you to uh, raise problems down the road. Okay, let's talk about just a few of them. They're already in the um, lectures. So first thing, obviously, you're going to start want to start off with a kind of with just some sort of summary. You know, this is just the slogan that you like. So the captain of the ship of your life, or if you like me, you know, being the boss of you, right? Whatever it is, you want to say a little bit about that, but don't go overboard, right? This is just a couple of sentences just to get the reader warmed up. Making sure that you say why we care about it, you know, at least say something along the lines of, you know, you're living in accordance with the values that matter to you and blah, blah, blah. Now to the details. One set of things you're going to need is the capacity, is a bunch of capacities, a bunch of things about you that matter for your ability to be autonomous. So as we've talked about um, in the, the first unit, you need the ability to be rational, to reason in certain ways, right? Um, you need to be able to uh, connect your desires to possible actions, right? So if you think, in, you know, if you want to eat a taco and you know that to eat a taco, you can get a delicious one at your local North Hollywood taco tent, then you will conclude, I should go to my North Hollywood taco tent, as I will do once this is done. All right, so you need to be able to tie things together um, to reason in a logical way uh, in order to be autonomous. Tying stuff together that's in your head is great, but if you don't have stuff in your head and you don't know what's in your head, um, well, then you're pretty much stuck, right? So you need to know, you need to have some sort of degree of self-knowledge. You need to be able, you need to both be able to and be used to doing it uh, to think about, you know, what's going on in your own head, to think about how, uh, what it is that you want, to think about what it is that you value, um, and to think about, you know, sort of how you feel about things. So you're going to need the ability to sort of reason, tie stuff together, but you're also going to need to know what your own beliefs are, what your own dispositions are. You're going to need to know a bit about your own strengths and your own weaknesses, like what kind of things are going to be more of a challenge than others. Um, you're also going to need to know, um, have access to sort of your own how you feel about things, right? So that means both being able to sort of, you know, identify what your your particular feelings are um, in a particular situation. So that means, for example, having a decent kind of uh, breadth of emotional language, um, you know, in order to make these kind of identifications, right? Because if you only can think like, I am angry, and I am, or I am sad, or I am happy, right? If if those are the only kind of emotions that you can identify in yourself, you're gonna miss a lot of stuff, right? Because things are complicated, we often have mixed feelings, and you need to be able to identify, you know, sort of when you're feeling what. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm mainly talking to, um, let's just say, a certain half of the class, um, and speaking from experience, 
a lot of us are brought up to not think about our emotions, to not talk about our feelings. And that's a, that can be a real um, struggle when, it, when you're trying to act in an autonomous way because you don't quite know what it is that you're going to feel, so you can't make plans or decisions about that, right? You don't know how to conceptualize something that's a negative feeling, but it might not be so negative that's overwhelming, right? Because, you know, there's some positive in there, right? So you need some emotional skills in order to, um, in order to be autonomous. So you have to be able to identify them. You have to be able to sort of predict them. You have to know the kind of situations that when you're in them, you get really stressed, right? Um, you need to know how to sort of manage them. So you need to, and maybe that goes a little under self-control, right? So you need to have strategies for uh, being able to keep a cool head in a situation that you know you know you're going to be upset in, right? These are all skills, just like reasoning, just like you know, sort of introspection and all that. And they're all skills um, that all of us can do and all of us need if we're going to be autonomous. On top of that, of course, you're going to need some degree of uh, self-control, right? Because if you are going to live in a way that reflects the things that you really want, then you need to be able to make a decision about what it is you want and then sort of stick to that. If you get distracted by the next shiny thing, you're not going to be able to implement the kinds of things that you care. You know, you're not going to be able to sort of pursue things that you genuinely care about because you're constantly distracted by shiny things. And trust me, as somebody who does not have a ton of this, it's a problem, but you can work around it, right? And different people will have different amounts of it, right? There's not a, you need a ton, you know, for sure, you'd need enough for the kind of way that you think and the way you make decisions, okay? But you need some ability to control yourself and to act on, to resist temptation and to act on the kinds of decisions or the kinds of values and other things that you care about. Um, you know, just to give one more example here, if you're that uh, famous patient, I think he was known by the initials HM or HL, he was a, he had some sort of a infection or maybe it was a stroke that destroyed the parts of his brain that are responsible for long-term memory. Oliver Sacks wrote about him. Um, and so he basically had no um, memory of anything, you know, like more than like a minute ago, 30 seconds ago. So he was constantly living in the present. And if you're like that, it's not really gonna be terribly easy for you to be autonomous. Um, if you've ever seen the Memento, the, the, Memento, the movie Memento, um, it's sort of based on that. It's, the, it's about a character who loses his ability to or form long-term memories um and he does try to find you know ways to sort of string together his life he sort of tattoos himself with new bits of information that relate to the quest he thinks he's on um so you know maybe you can eke out a little bit if you don't have a lot of sort of across time self-control but yeah it's gonna be a problem you're going to need to have opportunities to act. If you do not have them, then you are not going to be able to be very autonomous, right? So my usual example is if somebody is locked inside a box, there's not a lot of things that you can do, right? Uh, you can look at the top of the box, you can turn on your side and look at the side of the box, but that's not going to be the kind of options that are you need to have to have a meaningful life, to have a life that is in accordance with the things that you want. At the same time, there's a lot of situations in which it can look like you have options, but, you know, they're not really choices, right? So uh, to give a dumb example, right, um, if you're trying to decide what, what to have for lunch um, and your options are peanut butter and jelly or being tortured, you don't have two choices there really, right? You only really have one. That's going to influence your ability to act autonomously. We'll talk about this down the road a little bit when we get to some of the social factors. You need to have some range of legitimate options ahead of you. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have, you know, the future be completely wide open because this is, you know, we're human beings. This is humanity. Nobody has the future completely wide open to them. There are some things that, you know, we just can't do. I am not very good at any sport that involves a ball. So, you know, professional ba basketball and, and baseball, right out for me in terms of future, right? So, you don't have to have every option, but you need a reasonable range of options. Just as importantly though, and I'm often I just talk about these as the same thing, you need to know what your options are. And this is actually harder in some cases. A lot of times your your perception of what your options are depend on, you know, for one thing, how much research you've done, like, you know, uh, to find out what your options are. But more importantly, 
a lot of time our beliefs about what our options are are f are dependent on um, the social context we're in, right? You have to, you know, you, you figure out what kind of things you might be able to do with your life by looking at, you know, sort of role models, by looking at thing, people and characters on TV, you know, all those sorts of things really can do a lot to uh, constrain us. So it's not enough that you have options. It's also important that you know your options and that you are sort of able to keep them in front of your mind when you are, um, when you're making your choices. This is a place where other people can interfere. Um, I'll talk about that more in a second, but you know, if a salesperson sort of can manipulate you during a, uh, you know, when you're say buying a car or something into sort of forgetting that there are other dealerships out there, um, other places you could go to buy a car or even other models that you could buy from that particular dealership. You know, if those, the it doesn't matter that there are in fact other places you could go. It matters that you are able to keep the various options in front of your mind when you're making your choice. Like I said, talking about the autonomy, you know, setting out the, all of this stuff about autonomy, um, applying it to the particular decision that you're talking about in your example, that's going to be the majority of your paper, really. I mean, that's the, the meat of it. And if you did all of that stuff right, um, you probably have set yourself up pretty good to take care of this stuff pretty quickly. Okay. Um, you know, you've left your places, yourself places to hook into. Okay. So let's just talk really quickly about some ways that other people can threaten your autonomy through their actions. One way that it's really easy to undermine somebody else's autonomy is, well, straight up threatening, right? This is my whole example of the per point, person pointing a gun at you saying your money or your life, and that not actually being an autonomous choice when you decide to give them your wallet, right? Because they are, you know, sort of not really presenting you with an op any, you know, a set of options that you could consent. So threats are really easy to undermine autonomy, but there's some other ones too that I think are worth thinking about. Um, your ability to reason, to have self-knowledge and, you know, sort of emotional awareness and, and, and self-control. All of that is dependent on, you know, you being in a good state of mind, right? So if somebody puts you in a situation where you're really stressed, right? You know, if you're once you get down that stress, you know, if you're in a really stressful situation, you don't actually hear things anymore, right? You don't smell things. You can't think about what's going, you know, you can't really think um, other than like right there in the moment, you know, I've, I've been hanging off the side of a mountain before when uh, the trail gave way. And I can tell you, it's, you're right there in the moment. It, it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, you aren't able to do any of these things that are required for autonomy, right? So putting some, somebody else putting you in a very stressful situation or doing things that get you emotionally riled up in a way that, you know, prevents you from actually being able to think clearly about what your options are and what actions you might want to take. Um, those are things that very, that, that do threaten a person's autonomy. And, you know, down the road, we're going to talk about uh, in unit, what is that for? We're going to talk about you know, sales techniques and how people, you know, salespeople often try to kind of pressure somebody so that they don't think about their options or they don't, you know, they can't, you know, kind of think clearly about what they actually want. So there's a lot of ways in which that can happen where you're sort of, un you know, you're undermined in those ways. Um, intoxication is another uh, easy way to undermine somebody's ability to be autonomous, right? So if you are really drunk when you make a decision, you didn't make a decision, right? I mean, yes, there's a level up until which you're taught you're still okay and can make a choice. But if you, for example, sign a contract to buy a car when you are shit faced, uh, you are that you didn't actually make that contract, right? That's not a valid contract. And if you could demonstrate, you know, hopefully you recorded some, you know, used your phone, you're like, oh, I'm going to I'm, I'm sign this, right? you probably can get out of that deal, right? Because you were not in a state of mind that was able to give consent, right? You were not able to make an autonomous choice because somebody else, because you were drunk, right? Um, 
So these are all ways that other people could influence your ability to be autonomous. You can think of a gazillion others, but what I want is you to focus on just, you know, really just one. I don't want you to go and, you know, get distracted saying, oh, here's 10 different things. I want you to focus on one and really tie it in to whichever part of the kind of prerequisites of autonomy that it bears on. And really just, you know, with anything in a philosophy paper, I want you to be very hand-holding, right? I want you to be like, here's every little tiny connection between these, right? So, you know, here's how the reasoning is impacted. Here's why this kind of impact of your ability to reason is going to make you not able to be autonomous, right? I want you to spell out all those details for me. Finally, what I want you to talk about is some social factors that can make it difficult to make an autonomous choice. And there is a gazillion of these. And again, I just want you to focus on one. Um, and it's going to matter, of course, on what you chose as your example and sort of how you set things up. Again, what I care about is that you tie it in in a way that I can see that you really understand how it is that this kind of pressure can undermine this bit of autonomy in that given example. So let's just mention a couple real quick. I think I've already said earlier, your economic options are relevant to your ability to make an autonomous choice, right? So if you are do not have enough money to eat or you are so constantly stressed by financial concerns or you're not, you don't have a place, you know, a regular place to sleep, all of those things, you know, being hungry, being tired, being stressed can really undermine your ability, you know, these sort of cognitive or mental abilities that you need to be um, autonomous, right? It also can uh, obviously undermine your options. Remember, you know, as I said, you don't need to have everything open to you to be autonomous, but you do need to have some options in order to be autonomous, right? And so if you don't have the means to make really any meaningful choices in the particular area that we're talking about because of economic concerns, then there's something about your, your kind of a social force that's pressing on you and preventing you from being autonomous. There's tons of other ones, right, to talk about. Um, I think I mentioned in the written lectures, though, that your perception of what your options are are very, very heavily contingent on, uh, on your sort of role models and uh, other sorts of cultural influences, right? If you think about, you know, sort of uh, looking, you know, thinking about careers, like if you had a big catalog or something in, of majors, you know, you're going through the list of majors, there's some ones that you're just, you're not even going to look at. You're going to just, you know, flip right past. And others that you look at is, you know, and to be like, eh, not for me, but, you know, maybe, but not for me, right? And others, hopefully, you know, hopefully philosophy. Uh, just kidding. No, not kidding at all. Uh, you know, you see that when you're like, that's the major for me. But the thing is that you flipped past a bunch for why? Like, what reasons made you flip past that? Why did you not think that that was an option for you? And there might be, you know, perfectly, you know, I'm just not interested in that kind of thing. But of course, what you're interested in is probably in part, you know, sort of socially, uh, it's stuff you learned, right? Um, we all have a very wide range of things that we could be interested in. And maybe, you know, if teachers, family, society encourages you to be interested in certain kinds of things, um, you'll be interested in those kind of things, right? Um, take a sociology class to for more details on this stuff but there's a lot of things you, a lot of ways in which your perception of what the options are for you um, are really influenced by these kind of forces and this is a place where it's very easy to find bad ways in which your perception of options gets in the way of your ability to be autonomous right because a lot of things because a lot of your uh, a lot of your choices and a lot of your perception of the options often terms is influenced by your social cultural position, right? Um, and things like, especially in American society, four times now, four times I've tried to record the part about how race and gender can, and the assumptions around them that get sort of transmitted to us through our social context, the way that those can mess up our ability to be autonomous. And four times I have lost the video. <laughs> So let's hope, because I think this stuff is actually the most important. Um, there is it in the le written lecture, but I'll try. All right, so real quick.
let's think about both cases real fast. Um, so if you think about in terms of career choices and whatnot, this is a really standard example, right? Um, society has transmitted to us assumptions about who can do what jobs. And those that's often completely unrelated to anything about the job, right? Um, so think of computer programming, right? That used to be a uh, quote unquote women's work because it was below the, you know, the status of men to do, right? It was drudgery um, and it was harder back then because you were writing stuff code that was closer to the metal. And then somewhere in the 90s or so, you know, a bunch of tech bro, you know, jerks started kind of getting rich and famous. And then it, all of a sudden it was like, that's the thing guys should do and women can't code, which again, F you, anyone that thinks that. But again, you can see that somebody who was uh, a woman who was coming up back in the day, um, going into college, you know, might have thought, hey, computer programming sounds great. Right. Or been, you know, and that could be through a variety of means, you know, what she sees in the media, what her advisors, mentors, pa parents, other people are telling her, um, you know, she sees that as an attractive career. And then, you know, sort of now closer to now, and I really wish this was not the case, but, you know, I'm guessing that a lot of women don't feel um, as attracted to computer programming as they might be um, because they see it as a field that's dominated by tech bro assholes. So again, what matters is your the options that you see for yourself and your perception of that is is determined in part by your social context, right? Um, and similar things operate for race, right? Especially in American society. Um, there's a, a lot of places where our assumptions about who can do what, you know, shape people's assumptions about what they can do. Um, one way to see this, and this is a complicated phenomenon, and I don't honestly know enough about it other than to know that it's real, but the details are very complicated and still a big area of research in other disciplines. So with that caveat, I think I remember back when um, uh, President Obama was elected back in the day, and a lot of people were saying, you know, this was a huge symbolic uh, event because up until that point, you know, a young a black kid growing up couldn't see her or his self, you know, being president, right? You had to have a, a real amount of imagination to see yourself doing that because, you know, you look at all the history, all the, all the presidents in American history, and it's all white dudes, right? Um, so it just doesn't seem to you that that's something that you could possibly do, right? Uh, so again, it's the presence of role models, it's the presence of, pres of um, people in the media, um, and other sort of vectors of culture. Vector sounds like it's a disease, but you know, there's other ways in which we all have assumptions about who can do what, right? And that is a real thing, and that can affect our autonomy, right? Because if we are not able to see certain things that we might be great at as options for us, then we're not going to do them, right? We're not going to even think about them. And that, I think, is a real, you know, well, it's a, a tragedy in general, uh, just given the widespread na nature of this, and B, um, it's uh, it, it's it's a it's a problem for people you know who are not going to necessarily be able to live, uh, you know. So it's an individual tragedy in that it limits our ability to live the way we want to live or live a way that might be very fulfilling to us um, in a you know to really sort of fully realize our autonomy. So hopefully this didn't get cut off. But uh, I think there's more detail in the written lectures because I think this is super important. Um, you, if you look at the Stanford Encyclopedia article on feminist theories of autonomy, you can also see some of the places where the stuff I'm talking about now actually um, comes into very critical contact with the idea of autonomy because there is a lot of reason to be skeptical of certain aspects of the notion of autonomy as I've been describing it. Well. I've been, I have a very feminist view of autonomy, so I've been trying to skirt around some of the harder edges uh, that 
will cause the problems, but there is some very serious uh, reason to be skeptical. So I think that's worth taking a look at anyways, but it's definitely a look at, uh, definitely worth taking a look at to help you write the last part about um, social forces, which I think the race and gender aspects of it are far more important than the economic stuff. Okay.